Good morning to you, Sam. So, not that many of us are here, but um, since there's not that many of us, how about we uh, scoot up a little bit closer and fill this room a little bit more, or at least up in the front. It's a little bit lonely up here, so uh, please, scoot forward just a little bit.
next song is Lamb of God. Again, uh, thinking on the week of Passover. I'm pretty sure Jesus Christ and God probably planned this, but they... For myself, I have no idea how they thought of this, but Jesus came down and he died during this week as the Passover lamb. His blood sprinkled on the door frames of our hearts so that we can be reconciled with the Father. So I pray and hope that as we sing this next song, Lamb of God, that's what we think about and what we praise God. Thank you. 
God, we come before you, we give you the praise, and we give you the honor. Because you're good. Because you love us. We pray that you would just be with us today, Lord. Help us to be reminded of what you have done on the cross for us. It is in your name that we give thanks and we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I'll be honest, uh, I don't know that Holy Week was something like the whole week I paid attention to. It was kind of something that, you know, Friday night, Friday was Good Friday, and Sunday was Easter, and that was about it. Um, but over the past couple of years, I've paid attention a little bit more to all of the days of the week, which has really been cool to look into and to look into Scripture. And actually did a series last year at our church where we walked through leading up to Easter each day. And what Jesus experienced each day. So today's Wednesday of Holy Week, right? Hello? Yes. Yeah, thank you. I like response. So if I ask a question, feel free to just give an answer, okay? Does that sound good? Yes. Thank you. There we go. All right. So Wednesday is known as, uh, in Holy Week, is known as Spy Wednesday. Anyone know why? Yeah, very good. Okay, they were plotting to get Jesus, and so it's known as Spy Wednesday. It's also known as Silent Wednesday because we don't hear very much at all about what Jesus did on Wednesday of that week. It was very quiet. Now, most, most people think he went off and prayed because he did that a lot of times before something major came along in his ministry. And so it's also known as Silent Wednesday. Tomorrow is Thursday, correct? Yes. Same, was, same for Jesus back then. Um, Thursday... And, the bit, and there was a lot that went on on Thursday. And if you go look and look into Thursday and all the events that happened, there was quite a bit that took place that day. Uh, but probably the most um, known thing was the meal that Jesus had with his disciples that evening, known as the Last Supper. Thank you. Someone's answered questions. That's great. So the Last Supper. And so I want to focus in a little bit on that. And today we will conclude by participating in communion, celebrating communion, and, and remembrance of what Jesus did for us. Uh, how many people get the version app? Anyone? Anyone have version app? You look at it, you use it for stuff. Uh, one of the things I like about version is every day they have a quick two to three minute little video and they talk about a verse of the day. And if you go on there and it's on the homepage, you just can watch that video and they got all kinds of different people that speak on there. And so one of the ones that came up the other day was talking about a conversation that took place at the Last Supper. And so if you have your Bibles or you want to go, your device, whatever you want to use, uh, turn to John chapter 13, verse 33 through 35. And uh, this is part of the conversation that John gives us from that day. So John 13, 33 through 35 says this, my children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I'm going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we have here in front of us um, this conversation that you had with your disciples. This is real. We know this happened, and we are thankful that we get to look at that. Father, as we spend time in this today, 
Holy Spirit, I ask that you would fill this place, fill our hearts, that your presence would be obvious to us, that you would draw our hearts to you. Lord, if there's any part in us that you need to come in so that we may be able to repent, I pray that you'll do that today. I pray that we will be open to you in the direction you call us to go. Father, thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in verse 33, Jesus is reminding his disciples that he's leaving uh, and that they will be responsible to carry on his mission. And I don't know the disciples quite, they don't completely understand what it is that's going on or where he's going. And they ask, I mean, Peter is asking, well, where are you going? How can we go there as well? And Jesus just says, tell you what, as I have loved you, you need to love each other. And, that, and he goes on to say that, that they will know you, people will know you by your love for each other. Because that's what, that's what Jesus does. So here's the question that I have. How does Jesus love us? How does Jesus, Jesus love us? So we're going to look at three things real quick on the ways that Jesus loves us. And the first one is this. Jesus loves us wholeheartedly. Jesus loves us wholeheartedly. And if you go back to the beginning of that chapter, verse uh, 1, it says, It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So even at the beginning of this chapter, Jesus is showing his love. And he goes on in this chapter then to wash his disciples' feet. Have you ever washed anyone's feet on purpose? Is it a lovely thing? Maybe to the one receiving the washing, but the one not, the one that is doing the washing, not so much. It's not a lovely thing, but that's what Jesus does for these guys. And their feet were probably way worse then than what our feet would be now. I don't know, I've got, I've got boys that played soccer. Their feet could get pretty bad. Um, in John 15, 9, Jesus tells us of his love for us and our need to love him. In 1 John, John says that God is love. In Psalm 36 and in Psalm 109, God is telling us about his unfailing love. In Ephesians chapter 2, God's, uh, God says, Paul is speaking, he says, God's love is displayed through his mercy. In 1 John chapter 3, God lavishes his love on us, calling us his children. God loves us wholeheartedly, and he does this through his son, through Jesus. We are created by God, exactly as we're supposed to be, and he loves us 100%. We don't always feel that way. We don't always believe that God loves us, but he does. He loves us unconditionally. Um, the question was asked to a bunch of college students that were part of the uh, um, Fellowship of Christian Athletes, and they were asked, when does God love you the most? Does he love you the most when you are doing exactly what he's called you to do, or you are serving him in a way that he wants you, or does he love you the most when you are right in the middle of your sin? Which, one, which time does he love you the most? He loves you the same both times. Whether we're doing exactly what he tells us to do or we are right in the middle of our sin, he loves us exactly the same because he loves us unconditionally. He loves us wholeheartedly. And scripture is clear about that love. Jesus knows us to the bottom of our heart and yet he loves us to the sky. He loves us completely. I have a daughter that's 16 years old now and at 16 sometimes it might feel like it's hard to love my daughter because she's 16 and uh, that can be difficult at times. Um, but I love her. When, I, when she was seven, we were, in, we were living up in Montana and uh, she was, I was taking her to school. I took her to, every, to school every day. Some days we would walk to school, uh, even in the snow. Uh, other days I would drive her to school. Well, this one particular day I was driving her to school. We weren't that far from the house, but uh, we got to school and there we didn't have these big, long pickup lines and drop-off lines like they have here. It's ridiculous. You just pulled up to the school and let your kid out. But I actually was able to let her out across the street, and then she got to go across the street to go to the school, and there was not even a crossing guard there. It was kind of cool. Um, but she was seven years old, and she gets out of the car, and she's standing there in the corner, and she does what she's supposed to. She looks both ways, which was good, and she crosses the street. And this crazy thing happened when she was crossing the street. She was in the middle of the crosswalk, and all of a sudden, 
my love for my seven-year-old daughter in that moment overwhelmed me. What was she doing that was so incredible in that moment? Anything? Walking. She was just walking. She was just crossing the street. Someone answered a question. Thank you. Uh, now, she does gymnastics. Well, she did gymnastics at that time, and she continued to do it. She's competed gymnastics, and she's done that for a long time. And so she's done that. She's, she just got accepted to the National Honor Society at, uh, in the high school here in Stevens County, and so that's a pretty big deal. Um, and so those are reasons that I could say, yes, I love my daughter because of these things. But in that moment, she was just crossing the street. She wasn't doing anything spectacular. And this overwhelming sense of love for my daughter just sprung up inside my heart. And it was amazing. And at the exact moment that that happened, God said to me, this is how I love you. I love you when you're just crossing the street. I love you when you're just doing your daily life, when you're just living life. Not when you're doing the things I call you to. Not anymore when you fall and you make a mistake. Just when you live life. Just because of you. Because he created us. He loves us. And he loves us wholeheartedly. The second way that Jesus loves us is that he loves us sacrificially. He loves us sacrificially. Uh, 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10 says this. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Jesus loves us, loves us sacrificially. Sacrificially, Philippians 2 tells us that he left his throne in heaven and came to be a man here on this earth. He did that to give himself to us. This is good news. This is the gospel. Okay? This is the gospel. God loves us. Our sins separate us from him. And these sins cannot be cleansed by good deeds. They are only cleansed because Jesus paid the price for our sin. And he went to the cross. He went to the cross. Have you ever stopped to think about what Jesus endured when he was crucified? Scripture is clear. It talks about that he was whipped. It talks about that he was beaten. It talks about that he was uh, given a crown of thorns that was placed on his head, and then eventually he was nailed to the cross. Have you ever stopped to think about all of those things? One, anyone here? I mean, I, I'm not going to ask that question. Jesus was beaten. He was hit hard. You ever been hit? I mean, sometimes, I don't want to go into that. Got into a fight. I got, I got beat up one time in seventh grade. It was not fun. He was bigger than I was, and I was running my mouth. I deserved it. <laughs> it hurt. Not too bad. But it hurt. Jesus got beat. It says that he was beaten so badly he was hardly recognized. He was whipped. The way that they whipped back then is they would tie you to the post. They would get out this uh, whip, and the whip had many objects in it that would also cause extra pain than just the whip. Sometimes they would put stones uh, in there. They would put bone in there, and they would put sharp objects in there to grab. And they wouldn't just you know, cause it to crack. They would actually throw this cat of nine tails across the back and let it kind of get, and they would kind of give it a little tug to grab, and then they would rip it out so that flesh would go with it, so that it would tear at the body. And they would do this not just one side, they would go from the other side, and that's how they would whip and tear. So imagine the back. And it also wouldn't just be on the back, the way it was done is that it would actually come around sometimes and grab onto the front and rip all the way across. That's the beating that Jesus took for us. And then they took this crown of thorns, and we have all kinds of little thorns around here. Uh, if you're in the woods anywhere, there's all kinds of little thorns. And those hurt. They, they scratch and they cause you to bleed. But these were like the big thorns, one to three inches, that were woven into this crown and placed onto his head. And then part of that beating then... I believe getting hit on the head and those crown being jabbed in even deeper. This is what Jesus went through for us. Then they laid him down on this wood, on this cross, and they took these iron spikes and uh, lots of conversation. They don't put them necessarily here in the hand because that can't hold the weight, but they put them here in the wrist, between the bones, below the wrist, because that can hold the weight. And they nailed it through, and they put it through here, and then they put it through his feet or his ankles as well. 
And that's the sacrifice Jesus made for us. But remember, he's on this piece of wood, and I don't believe that they sanded this piece of wood before they put him on it. It was probably very, very rough. And so imagine this back that's already been torn up, that it already has all this flesh that's hanging off, this crown of thorns on his head, and then they nail him in, and then they stand up this cross, and they put it there, and in order for that cross to stand, they usually drop it into a hole deep enough so that the cross would still stand with a man hanging on it. And so imagine that there he is nailed, and they raise it up, and it drops. Imagine that weight that's pulled when it drops on those points. And the reason they would crucify and they hold him in this position is because over time, they have to push up in order to breathe. It makes it very difficult to continue to breathe in the lungs. And so the person being crucified actually has to push up. Remember his back? Remember the wood? He has to push up in order to get a breath, or he has to pull up on those nails because his hands aren't grabbing on anything. He has to pull up and push up, and the back that's already torn up is being rubbed against that wooden cross just for himself to breathe. And ultimately, they die from crucifixion because they, their lungs fill with fluid, and they actually drown. And that's why when they poke Jesus aside with the spear, the water comes out because he was actually on his way to drown. And that's how most of them died in Christian. That's what Jesus did for us. That's what Jesus chose to do for us because he loves us sacrificially. Why did he do this? Because he was a priest. Hebrews 10, 12 through 14 in the message says this, as a priest, Christ made a single sacrifice for our sins. And that was it. Then he sat down right beside God and waited for his enemies to come in, to cave in. It was the perfect sacrifice by a perfect person to perfect some very imperfect people. That's what Jesus did for us because he loves us sacrificially. The third way that Jesus loves us is that he loves us eternally. He loves us eternally. Everyone who, who believes in Jesus will be saved. And then the cool thing is that life with Jesus starts now and lasts forever. Eternally. It lasts forever. If you know Jesus is your Savior, then you will live with him forever. Beginning now. Because why? He sends his Holy Spirit to live inside of us. He, he is here with us. He promises never to leave us, forsake us. And so we get to experience Jesus now and that lasts forever. John 3.16 for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, and whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 17 is even better. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. We're not condemned. He loves us. He loves us. Deuteronomy tells us about the fact that God is eternal and his love is eternal. Jeremiah 31 says that God's love is everlasting. John 10, 28 says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. 1 Peter 5, 10 says, and the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you, make you strong, firm, and steadfast. 1 John 5.13 says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Jesus loves us eternally. And so he calls us to love. He calls us to love. He says that we get to carry on his mission. New commandment I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So we get to be known as Jesus' disciples because we love like Jesus. How are we doing about that? How are we doing with that? Are we loving others wholeheartedly? Are we loving others sacrificially? Are we loving others eternally? Well, I say, I don't know about eternally. But do we let situations change the way we love someone? 
If they do something to us, well, I didn't like the way they said that. I didn't like the way they acted there. I don't like the way they did this. I don't know that I'm going to love them anymore. Or do we just make a commitment? You know, I know this person, their brother in Christ, their sister in Christ. I'm going to love them because Jesus loved them and I'm going to show that love for them. Today we get to celebrate communion. We get to remember another thing that took place that Thursday night during that supper. And that was Jesus said, hey, do this in remembrance of me. But Paul in 1 Corinthians tells us that if there's something going on that would block you from being able to come to the table and do this, then you need to take care of it. Are you loving like Jesus loves today? Do you represent him well when it comes to loving others and loving him? Maybe there's someone that you would say, you know, I have not been the greatest person to this person. Maybe there's someone that you need to go to today. Maybe there's someone that you need to call, text, something today and say, hey, I'm sorry. I have not loved well in the name of Jesus. And I'm going to say this. Maybe you feel like there's someone that needs to do that for you. Um, you may wait a long time for that to ever happen. So you might need to go ahead and just forgive them. And I know, just forgive. It sounds real easy. I know, it's hard, but I believe through the Holy Spirit that he would help you be able to do that. If you're waiting for someone to come apologize to you, forgive them, love them, because Jesus doesn't give us conditions on when we get to love and when we don't get to love. He just says, love. Stephen Foster from Oxford Church says this. He says, it seems the acid test for our discipleship is not the extent of our knowledge, but rather the depth of our love. Do we love like Jesus? This Easter season, we have the opportunity to remember how Jesus loves us, but also how he has called us to love one another. So today, we get to remember all of this through communion. All of this through communion. Um, and so I want to invite, we have some people that are going to stand at these different tables here, and, uh, and I think we're going to have a musician come and play from the piano. And so I want you guys right now, go ahead and close your eyes, bow your heads, and go into a time of worship through prayer as we have opportunity to participate in communion. And we're going to do it a little bit different today. What we're going to do is we have these stations up front, and depending on what section you're in, uh, I'm going to pray in a second. I'm going to have you guys stand. When I do, what, you, what we'll do is when I invite you to come forward, you're just going to go out your left side and come up that aisle and receive the cup and receive the bread and then come across the front and go back up the next aisle, go back to your seat. If you feel led to use this as an altar and do communion up here and spend some time in prayer, please feel free to do that. If you would rather just go back to your seat and sit there and take communion there, you can do that as well. If there's even a couple of you that might want to just clump up together and do communion together. That's good too. But once I read the scripture and pray, you guys will be invited to come and then you are free to stay and go as long as you need, however you want to do it. At some point during the meal, Jesus said this while they were eating. This is according to Matthew 26. Jesus took bread and we had given thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body. And then he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it all of you. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus came to this earth because he loved us wholeheartedly. He went to the cross and died for us because he loves us sacrificially he rose from the, from the dead and has invited us to be with him because he loves us eternally. And we get to respond to his love by representing him well and loving others. Father, I thank you for these folks. I thank you for these students. And I thank you that they are here today, that they have chosen to follow you. And I ask right now that they will grow to a place deeper 
in their walk with you, that they will understand more about your love and how much you love them. And as a result of understanding that more, your love will flow out of them as they love others and love you. I pray that this group of students will represent you well when it comes to your love. Thank you, Jesus. I invite you to stand. As I said, when you're ready to come receive communion, go out to the left side, come up the aisle, come receive. And again, you can take communion up here or you can go back up to your seat. Everyone stand and go out to the left when you're ready. Thank you. 